Welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining this uh, webinar. Uh, today we have a special guest, a very uh, professional person uh, relation, in relation with the sanitation and uh, sledge management and, and all that. I would like to give straight away the word to Marina Peter, who is going to introduce herself and who is going to make this uh, presentation. Marina, up to you. Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for inviting me to be a, a part, a guest here on this meeting. So my name is Marina Peter. I'm working as a research scientist at the University of Applied Sciences and Arts, Northwestern Switzerland. So I've been working also in Water Research Institute, EAVAC, and uh, basically my topics of research and interest are water and sanitation in the context of humanitarian context and development context. So I've been managing different projects around the world in this area. So today um, I'm going to present you the sanitation compendium, the initiative of the German WASH network as well as EAVOC. So on the WASH cluster, which has been developed uh, as a kind of combination of uh, um, different technologies uh, and trying to combine everything what happens in the water uh, in the sanitation sector. So um, technologies which are available there in the one concise document. So I'm going now to start my uh, presentation and please feel free to interrupt and ask questions if you like. So uh, the information I'm going to present is not just my work. So it's also, I will show some videos of the massive open online course, which is called Introduction to Public Health Engineering and Humanitarian Context. This course has been developed by RCRC and EAVAC and us together. So it is available online. And if you would like to have any more information on sanitation or also other public health engineering aspects. So please take this course, visit every two to four weeks, there is a new course starting, you can attend and it's completely free of charge for you. So uh, therefore all the pictures and all the information which is shown in this video, it's also uh, property rights from EAVAC, RCRC or EPF also, not only us. So uh, the idea of uh, this presentation now, this hour we are going to spend together is basically to learn about sanitation goals and also sanitation products which are there. So look at the criteria which influence sanitation technology selection. So for different emergency contexts, starting from the acute phase and going Ms. down. Marina, to... would you please go a little bit slower? Yes, sure. Thank you. So our idea is to learn which criteria influence sanitation technology selection, starting from the acute phase and going over to the um, uh, rec stabilization and recovery phases of the emergency. So we would like to show some information about technology, technology, sanitation technologies, which are used in acute phase of the emergency and have a show small video about that. So, and I will introduce shortly how to use the compendium sanitation technologies once you're going to use it on, um, on yourself. So, and there is also a Arabic version of this document, um, which is used not for emergency context. And I hope that the Arabic version of the emergency compendium comes up later as well. So maybe first question to ask, I mean, what is the sanitation system generally? I mean, what sanitation systems uh, um, address? So, and one definition from Water Supply and Sanitation Collaborative Council is that sanitation is a collection, transport, treatment, and disposal or reuse of human excreta, domestic wastewater, and solid waste, and associated hygiene promotion. So it addresses a lot of different uh, aspects of sanitation, right? We talk about wastewater management, but we talk also about hygiene and uh, dead body disposal, solid waste management, or also healthcare waste management, for example, as well as hand washing. So it's a lot of different aspects. And in this lecture today, we are focused mostly on the wastewater management as well as, well as its excreta management and focus less on other aspects. We will talk about hygiene promotion and uh, healthcare waste, maybe more when we talk about water and wash in general in uh, the next lecture next week. So if you look on the goals of the sanitation uh, in emergencies, we know that the first goal we have in mind is to protect public health. However, um, it's coming more and more that um, uh, there is a conflict between the public health or maybe there are conflicts with the environmental health happening. So basically that uh, you can imagine um, a truck, a vacuum truck disposed in fecal matter away from refugee camp can also pollute the environment somewhere else. So there are certain conflicts coming up there. And the third goal of sanitation can be also try to create systems where you can you reuse sanitation products. So you not just create more waste, but you actually try to manage your wastewater or excreta in the ways that you create something valuable out of that. 
So it used to be public health only, but there are also initiatives coming up there focusing on environment and uh, sanitation products. Maybe just a reminder for you, you might know this 5F diagram, which we like to talk, but if you're thinking about the health and public health, I mean, we have to think about how does uh, public health is affected. And the 5F diagram shows us that basically the feces, can you see my, my arrow showing on the screen or not? Yes, yeah, we can see that. Perfect. Yes. So if you see the feces, so basically from the feces, the way how we can get uh, the pathogens to new host is going either through fluids, like drinking water, for example, through fingers, you know, touching the feces and then uh, going directly to the new host, through flies, which can go on the, um, or other uh, vectors, which can kind of sit on the feces and then go over food or the new host, or through fields, which in this case, we mean agriculture, for example, the feces being disposed uh, directly in the agriculture, fields and protect or, or contaminate either food or go directly to the new host. So if you want to cut those barriers and this transmission routes, we need to implement some barriers and the red barrier you see here, this is basically sanitation, right? But we stop the transmission between feces to fluids, fingers, flies and food. So if you look on the later on the stage, we will think also about the water, drinking water treatment, water quality, as well as the hygiene, which uh, kind of get the second the secondary barriers inside the system. So today our focus is really on the first barrier we talk about. So, and before we go on into just the sanitation and wastewater treatment and excreta management, I would just like again to stop that the, um, the hand washing is a really important part of the sanitation system. We are not going to talk about it later on, but without proper hand washing facilities and any kind of sanitation infrastructure, so uh, a lot of the work which is done for sanitation is basically done for nothing in the end. So basically because we don't stop the transmission directly. So having hand washing facilities and proper working hand washing facilities, including running water or just water tanks and soap. So it's extremely important for sanitation. So when we talk about sanitation, I mean, what do we think about first? So um, we would like to talk about the sanitation products first. So sanitation products we think of directly is basically urine and feces. That's what our uh, body is producing, right? So together, combining urine and feces, we are talking about excreta. So this is the terminology we are going to use here. So if we use a flush water in our system, so it's not a dry system, but it's a wet system, so it uses flush water, then the combination of feces and the flush water will give us a brown water. If we add anal cleansing water or materials to that and combine this all together, then we will be talking about the black water. There is also a term of wastewater which we use, which is sometimes used as the component of the, or as kind of the synonym for the black water. So, however, um, I prefer to use the term of black water because it really explains what is there. What we also think is the gray water, a use of gray water. This is basically water which is being produced uh, during busing, washing, uh, cooking, and so as wastewater being there, which has to be managed as well. So, but um, we see it also as a part of the system, but in some of the systems we are going to look at, like we don't want to mix gray water and black water together. Another important information you see on this table, right? So there we have to think what kind of products are being produced in sanitation systems and what exactly it means. So if you look on the volume, then we know that generally in a kind of normal wastewater system we are, we are used to in an industrialized country context, I mean, we produce about uh, 25,000 to 100,000 liters of wastewater or generally black water, um, including gray water. So, and in this case, most of this volume is basically gray water, only 500 liters and, of urine and about 50 um, liters of feces. If you look on the, uh, so most of this volume which is being produced is basically gray water, if the system includes the gray water. So in case, if you look on the nutrients which are being produced there, then we see a nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. So we see that most of these nutrients are actually being hit in urine. So only a small part of it is being sent in the gray water and also is excreted with feces. But most of the nutrients uh, come actually together in urine. While if you look on the fecal coliforms, that most of the fecal coliforms is basically being excreted through fecal matter. Well, urine, um, in most cases, is almost sterile, so it doesn't have um, high contamination with fecal coliforms. So, well, also because of the basin facilities in washing, some fecal coliforms can also end up being in gray water. 
this is important this table to understand especially when we talk about urine separation different options and technologies which is there so um, if you talk about sanitation products we discuss now the primary products which are basically the inputs so uh, what we also think of is a kind of secondary products are basically the outputs of the system so if we take a look on the urine and we just wait for some time what happens is the ph of the urine increases there are some processes happening there and then we have a stored urine stored urine can be used for example directly as fertilizer so there is actually only time required to convert that into the output which can be used directly somewhere so if you look on the feces, same thing, if you just take feces without not mix with water, urine, other things, I mean, we give it time, we give it a little bit of heat, and in the end, we end up with a dried feces, which can be, for example, used as a soil conditioner. So the transformation processes and the dried feces output of our system. Let's look on the whole excreta, and here again, we need some time, and then digestion processes happening, and we might end up with a peat formation system. So um, the kind of sanitation system is basically about this transformation of the input products into the output products, you have to think about. Looking more on the black water, basically, which is being generated, I mean, we need to implement, because we are mixing it with splash water, with other materials. So in the end, we need to have some physical separation or digestion processes happening. And then we end up with two output products, which is either sludge or effluent, both of this happening during the wastewater treatment. So uh, basically, this is uh, kind of the secondary products or outputs of our system. And these products in the end, they have to be somehow used or utilized or disposed in the end, right? So as a kind of final result of the sanitation system. However, we have also to think that there is a possibility to sanitation technologies to produce some beneficial products. This could be, for example, compost or hummus, which can be used directly in agriculture, can be biogas as a result of sanitation system. Or we can also have a water which can be discharged directly in water bodies without contaminating them extremely or water which is used for example for irrigation so except of the just the output products we have as a result of sanitation system we might also think of beneficial products being kind of built in the sanitation system which can be used for something later on so um in the end this kind of products we want to have in the end and products which we are bringing in our system they will uh, they will focus and will then influence the choice of the technologies we have in our system. So um, here I would like now to switch to a short video, uh, which is, uh, will show us a nice summary about a different functional group of sanitation system. So and as I said before, basically sanitation systems about these different products happening. So we want to see um, what kind of functional groups of sanitation systems are there and the video will explain that. What are the function groups of a sanitation system? A sanitation system is more than just a toilet. There are other functions that need to be covered. Let's have a look at the system on this slide and how different sanitation products move through the system. What you see is a dry toilet over a single ventilated improved pit. The excreta indicated by the black arrow is emptied and transported manually to a transfer station outside the neighborhood or for example a refugee camp. From there a truck takes sludge to a thickening pond where the sludge settles to the ground and the clear effluent stays on top. Effluent, now shown as a blue arrow, is further treated in waste stabilization ponds, while the sludge, shown as the brown arrow now, is put onto planted drying beds. Once the sludge is dried, it can be applied in agriculture, and now treated effluent is added to the groundwater. Now, how can we categorize these technologies and approach the mess on this slide in a systematic manner? In the compendium of sanitation systems and technologies, we categorize all sanitation technologies into five different groups with the color code as seen on the image. A sanitation system always consists of a combination of technologies from several or maybe even all of the five different categories. The first functional group is called user interface, meaning the toilet itself. So the interface between the user and the rest of the sanitation system. This can be a dry toilet, flush toilet, or a urine diverting toilet. Sanitation products have to be collected and stored on site in some systems. Therefore, the name of the second functional groups are indicated by the color orange. There, some treatments can already occur. A vital use technology from this category is the septic tank. In the 
septic tank, some physical separation of sludge and effluent occurs, and some anaerobic degradation. Once the collection technology is full, the sanitation products need to be emptied and transported. This yellow category is called conveyance. All sanitation products need treatment, thus all treatment technologies are categorized into four green functional groups, and finally, they can be safely reused or disposed as indicated by the blue functional group called use and disposal. If you want to find out more about this, please check out the compendium of sanitation systems and technologies, where all of this is explained in more detail, or check out the other online courses by Yama. During a humanitarian crisis, resources are limited and sanitation systems break down, are inexistent, or have been destroyed. It is therefore not feasible to implement a complete sanitation system from the very beginning that takes into our consideration all functions. The sphere standards provide guidance on the minimal standards for excreta management during a humanitarian response. This can help to set priorities and provide minimal services. There are two standards for excreta management in the sphere guidelines, which we will have a closer look at. The first goal of excreta management is to create an environment free from human feces, meaning that all living areas are free from fecal contamination. The first key action is to implement appropriate excreta containment measures. With the lack of resources, this can mean a cleanup campaign, the demarcation of defecation fields, and the construction of public toilet facilities. All of these actions have to be implemented in consultation and coordination with the affected community, as they have key information from the ground and will be the ones to use the facilities. Sanitation facilities have to be constructed away from water sources and not too close to the groundwater table. Locations downstream of rivers or at the bottom of a slope are therefore preferred. The second minimal standard in sphere is the safe containment of excreta. The standard says that all affected people should have adequate, appropriate, and acceptable toilets sufficiently close to their living spaces to allow rapid, safe, and secure access at all times, day and night. There are three key actions to take in the first step. Consultation of the affected community on the planned actions and the provision of adequate toilets and hand washing facilities. But a toilet is not just a toilet. There are several functions that a toilet has to fulfill in order to qualify as adequate, appropriate, and acceptable. A toilet has to be inclusive to everybody, including elderly people, people with reduced ability, pregnant women, children, staff, and everyone else. The toilet should be by constructing public toilets not more than 50 meters away from dwelling, by sex to fulfill basic hygienic functions such as the possi possibility for menstrual hygiene management, at minimum through the provision of water and a solid waste bin with solid. Also, hand washing facilities and avoiding that the toilet becomes a breeding nest for flies and mosquitoes is needed. It should be ensured that the toilets can be emptied when full and that transport, treatment, and disposal or reuse of sludge is warranted. Toilets should not be a source of groundwater contamination. For public toilets, there should not be more than 50 people per toilet in a female to male ratio of 3 to 1. However, the goal of any long term intervention is to provide household toilets which are organized by the community themselves. Many prolonged humanitarian responses require an action plan that goes beyond quick fixes and immediate interventions. A long-term action plan is needed after immediate actions were implemented. This includes the rehabilitation of existing infrastructure or the construction of new one. Implementation can be done stepwise with services that are upgradable. Constant monitoring is required in order to assure the success of the steps. Especially in the acute phase of an emergency, public and environmental health threats need constant surveillance. The data for monitoring can be gathered through community service, observation in the field, and expert interviews. As mentioned before, sanitation systems have to fulfill different needs during different phases and types of a humanitarian response. 
which can require different technologies and services than those needed at a different stage. During chronic crisis, these different phases cannot be distinguished and several interventions might have to be implemented at the same time. In the following example, the goal is to show how sanitation systems can be developed over time. This fictional example of an armed conflict forces the city's inhabitants to flee their houses and resettle in an isolated rural area. Water supply is not yet provided, and the first goal is to provide a quick fix sanitation solution that serves a large amount of people and that safely contains excreta from human contact. The proposed first step is to implement public shallow trench latrines together with hand washing facilities next to the latrines so that the first standard of sphere can be fulfilled. These interventions are complemented with a hygiene awareness campaign in order to educate people on public health threats and to stop open defecation. We will develop the system in this example with the terminology of the five functional groups from the compendium. Shallow trench latrines can be implemented quickly using local materials. Little construction work is needed. The shallow trench latrine will be explained in more detail in a later module. The public shallow trench latrines will fill up quickly and adequate treatment and disposal is needed. On-site light lime treatments can help to hygienize the excreta. Afterwards, the trenches are filled and covered and the site must be decommissioned and secured. This will help to prevent human contact with the contained feces in the long term. After the acute phase is over and more materials, skills and capacities enter the newly formed refugee camp, more appropriate sanitation solutions can be implemented in parallel to the public shell trench latrines. A raised latrine can be constructed with a holding tank below as more material like tanks and toilet user interface are now entering the affected area or have been produced or organized locally. On this image behind me, you see such raised latrines with buckets beneath that can be emptied easily. In the forefront, a simple hand washing facility provides necessary hand hygiene after defecation. These public latrines were implemented in Haiti. As these holding tanks fill up, a conveyance method is needed. Vacuum trucks will empty the holding tanks, dispose the pico sludge in an adequate distance from the human settlement, as no treatment system is yet in place. This simple service extension further can guarantee public health in the camp. As there are still no treatment options available, the waste is disposed in the form of service application without treatment. This is not an ideal situation as it threatens environmental health. This leads to the next extension of sanitation services. The goal now is to provide an improved sanitation system that covers all steps of the sanitation service chain, is appropriate to the urban community living in the camp, and that provides toilets on household level instead of public toilets. Furthermore, the system needs to be upscalable and resilient to future acute humanitarian responses. Therefore, poor flush toilets are constructed at a household level as the urban community is used to the water-based sanitation systems and will not accept dry sanitation systems in the long term. Septic tanks are constructed in the first step. To treat the sludge from the septic tank and the holding tanks, unplanted drying beds are constructed before final disposal in the form of now safe service application of sludge. The effluent from septic tanks is disposed in the ground without treatment at this point. As an intermediate step until unplanted drying beds can be constructed, some short-term sludge treatment facilities can be implemented. Such as sun drying beds, like the ones in the image behind me, implemented by Oxfam during the 2014 emergency response in the Philippines. Finally, a simplified sewer can replace transport of the effluent from the septic tank to treatment and waste stabilization ponds. The raised latrines can still be used in public places, such as schools, markets, health centers, etc. Please note, due to time constraints, that we only talked about the technology part of the sanitation system. However, as you know, the sanitation system not only consists of hardware, but also software. This has to be developed as well. Users need to be informed and involved, staff needs to be trained, financing of the system has to be secured, including for operation maintenance. 
All of this takes time and resources and has to be taken into account. This example shows just one way of how a system can be developed. This development always has to be based on many different criteria in order to select the best fit and the most appropriate system. The criteria will be introduced in more detail in another module. In this module, you have learned why sanitation service delivery is crucial for maintaining public health during humanitarian crises. You've learned about the different functional groups that are needed for full sanitation service delivery. Then have a look at the sphere standards for emergency excrement disposal. Please remember that these standards are minimal standards for an acute humanitarian crisis and that implementing them will not provide a complete sanitation system. You will have to upgrade the sanitation system over the course of a humanitarian response as the needs will change and there is no one-size-fits-all solution to sanitation. We had a look at And I think the video showed nicely about this different, like it showed nicely in an example, how the system can develop in time. Mm, sorry, I'm struggling a little bit. So, um, so I'm coming back. I hope you can hear me and I hope you can see also the slide. So, um, I mean, the video I think showed nicely how we can also, uh, how the systems can emerge during the time. So we, through the changes, through the acute response phase, where very simple measures according to sphere standards or minimal sphere standards can, can go through or can be proposed while with the time during their stabilization recovery phases, uh, the system can emerge further on and basically changing from very basic communal or community type of sanitation solutions going into the household level, so which is more acceptable and also more appreciated by the users. So um, we have seen one example, but generally there's a big number of uh, different technologies and sanitation systems which are there. And I think something we should look at first is like how do we select the sanitation system, so which is most appropriate for this context for the conditions we are. So of course, this is the um, phases of emergencies we have to consider, but there's also different type of context. And generally we define between the natural bint environments we have to consider. So what you see on this uh, slide is basically the natural or conditions or environment which is there, which might affect the choice of the sanitation system. For example, one a very clear one, for example, is a groundwater table, right? We won't use the same type of technologies for in the situations where we have very high groundwater table and we might contaminate it comparison to another situation where groundwater is deep. Uh, the space availability can be issue. Uh, if there are existing water bodies, how close they are and what they're used for. Demography developments, properties of the soil. I mean, if the soil can infiltrate water easily, it uh, might be different type of technology to use than if the, you have a very rock structures and it's almost impossible to dig there. So, of course, the climate conditions, and uh, I think one of the most important things is also existing sanita sanitation systems which are there, and how these existing sanitation systems are used and what the people use them. So uh, besides this natural and environment, environments, what we also have to consider strongly is this, the, we call it the enabling environment. So basically, this is uh, the software around it, um, which is important for choose of the technologies. For example, what the government is currently doing and what kind of government support can be expect from us. What technologies are actually permitted by the law or sometimes forbidden to, to use by the law. So uh, which institutions need to be involved? What kind of regulatory framework is there around? So what is the available capacity for construction operations and maintenance of certain technology? So um, the payments or who pays for the services and some kind of very typical user aspects, for example, are we dealing with the people who use the toilet paper or who wash themselves with the um, and regenerate anacleasin water? So do we have people who are sitters, so sit on the toilet, or who are squatters, who are kind of squatting over the toilet? So the sanitation system will be dependent strongly on that. So, and in the end, availability of uh, financial resources and capacity for construction, operation, maintenance will define the type of system. 
So we're dealing about the hardware factors and you have the enabling environment which you have to take in, um, into consideration. If you think of the uh, methods, so how do we define those factors? I mean, we know about different assessment methods and tools and I, I, I believe that you're already using different types of assessment. So generally all of the different assessment tools which are there available proposed by different organizations, they have like three types of methods included. So this is basically review of the information available through governmental documents, service provider information, whatever is there. So the field observations where we go in the field and we try to measure and test things, for example, using groundwater assessment platforms or information there and methods. So trying to measure the slope and understand the profile or looking at the soil. So as well as the mapping techniques. And when we want to understand more from the uh, information from the software side, you know, sometimes the surveys and participatory methods can be useful. For example, the um, talking to the local engineers and health staff there, the formal and informal leaders and affected groups, which we have to consider, which are not only just the leaders there, but also the different user groups, for example, women, children, diverse individuals, including the people with disabilities which have to be addressed, they have to be talked to, to see that they address also those needs and not the needs, for example, only of the men in the community. So uh, this kind of choice of the technologies is supported by the compendium of sanitation systems and technologies and emergencies. I hope you have seen this book already. This book is available for download for free. So I think it's not yet available on Arabic, but it might be available at certain point. So um, it's, uh, this book basically combines uh, all kinds of different technologies and approaches which is there for sanitation and describes in very short sheets, like you see an example here of the septic tank, right? So explaining uh, the technology description, design consideration, materials, applicability, operation maintenance, used for this kind of technology, health and safety aspects, cost, social considerations related to use of the technology, strengths and weaknesses, and provides you also references for the reading. The document is not there as a, and can, cannot be used to support construction or planning activities. So because it's just little information available for each of the technology, we have just a two page sheet, but it provides you an overview. So once you kind of uh, looked in the technologies which might be applicable for your context. So for example, for the phases of emergency you are or space uh, requirements you have, then you can go more into detail and use the references for the read information to really understand the principle of technology and uh, finally be able to plan that. Uh, I interrupt you, uh, Marina, just yes. in the chat, I put the link where you can find and download the sanitation compendium on all the languages. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, the video you have seen, it's also, this is the video from this course. So I'm also just posting the link here that it's available, you see that. So uh, there is much more information there. It's basically a five week course with just a couple of hours you can spend per week uh, doing on this course. So learning about different sanitation technologies, but also other aspects of the public health engineering emergency context. So now I'm going to uh, switch to the presentation specifically on the compendium and explain you a little bit how to use a compendium, what you can expect inside. And then if you still have time and you still have interest, we can go more in detail of specific technologies or we just leave it for another time if there is any kind of follow-up questions there. So I'm quickly changing the presentation. Yeah. And I'm going to the, I want to show you this one here. So, uh, yes, I hope you see that now. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so this compendium, this book is basically based, it has two parts in it. And first part is uh, helps you how to basically structure your technologies and what kind of context you can expect them for. So what you see here is basically an example of this, um, uh, of the sheet where you see the, all the technologies which are there. So we have the products here, we have the on-site treatment, maybe I'll go to the next stage now you see it better. So here we see, we see the input products, the ones I mentioned and some more of that, which can go inside the system. Then we have type of on-site technologies which, um, which happen in or which have to be installed on-site. So this is a type of user interface. In our case, the type of the toilet we are using, right? And a type of the on-site collections and storage, which is there. So, or even some, some kind of treatment which might happen on-site. 
then we know the technologies have been transported, like the, the products which are generated on the stage, they might have to be transported later on. So we can talk about a different type of transport technologies, which can be basically a sewer type of technologies, or this is manual or motorized empty transport of the fecal sludge from the latrines. So, and finally, we are thinking about the off-site technologies, basically all kind of uh, semi-centralized treatment systems, like you might know from wastewater treatment to large scale, for example, um, waste stabilization ponds, so planted drying beds, uh, compost, and so on. So, or uh, as a next step was a large step, we can think about the use and disposal. So basically, which can be uh, disposed in the sludge in a way that it doesn't affect environment and public health. So, or really applying the products, which are the kind of positive or useful products of the sanitation system, for example, a biogas or a compost or wastewater being used for irrigation or fish ponds. So besides that, the compendium has a cross-cutting issue part, which really shows more on the ways of assessment and rehabilitation of infrastructure, addresses the points of uh, resilience, preparedness, operation maintenance, as well as the design and social consideration, focusing, for example, inclusive and equitable design or gender-related aspects. Okay. So furthermore, the compendium tries to help to structure these technologies according, for example, of the use in acute response phase. So something, the technologies which can be applied very fast in acute conditions, so, or have to be applied in it, or technologies which are more suitable rather for stabilization recovery phase where we are aware that it takes time and resources and uh, uh, a lot of other conditions actually to be able to install those and use those technologies and apply them. So, but um, that should be kind of a goal on the long term to improve the sanitation system. Furthermore, uh, there is a structure also of the technologies according to the ground conditions. So basically, uh, depending on uh, conditions which are kind of, uh, you know, areas, for example, which are dry or uh, areas which are close to flooding, they'll have different types of technologies. So this kind of tables and rises those technologies. I don't go much into detail of that. So as well as we try to distinguish between the water-based systems, so systems which are basically using the flush water or toilets with flush, water, flush toilets or poor flush toilets. So where we mix uh, uh, all these different input products into basically in the, end, the black water. So, or where we use the dry technologies where we can imagine more rise like a dry toilets even the urine diverting toilets, they're just being managed in a different way. And then we end up with having fecal sludge or just simply dry products, like dry, dry pit homes or so on coming out of that. So some of the technologies can be also used both like as water-based or dry, depending on the way how they've been constructed. So, and as you see here in this example of the system, you know, you, you can see that uh, uh, these technologies are structured again, according to the way they can be applied for. So, the part two of the compendium really focus on these different technology sheets and uh, describing all of them. And uh, now if you have still some time, I would like to go, for example, through some of the interface technologies, so like interface collection, storage and treatment systems, basically, which uh, helps you to plan like really in acute phase and transferring later on to the, um, to, uh, to the stabilization recovery phases. So um, if you still have some time, I would just also like to show a very short video on um, user interface technologies and also examples um, from basically refugee uh, camp context, which I think that's something which might be relevant for this course. We will have a look at one technology that can be categorized as a user oh, Sorry, you don't have the... Shallow parental cream, yes. a simple upgrade to control the open defecation. Mm -hmm. Then you will be introduced to five on-site technologies from the collection and storage slash treatment functional group. Please note that this list is in no way complete and that you should consult other literature in order to find the best technology for your context. During an acute humanitarian crisis, it might be that sanitation infrastructure is completely destroyed or unusable in the short to medium term. People will still need to defecate and until another sanitation system exists, they are often forced to defecate in the open. This is a major health threat as it can spread diseases such as diarrhea, cholera, or typhus. 
Therefore, usually the first measure until materials for improved latrine construction are available is to control the open defecation that is going on. This means that designated areas should be allocated where open defecation is allowed. For example, a field away from health centers, schools or food places, such as kitchens and markets. There are several easy measures to improve a controlled open defecation field. Digging shallow trenches will make the commission of such a field easier, providing minimal privacy with simple screens can make it more dignified to use, and hand washing facilities will further enhance hygienic conditions. The way looks simple. Shallow trenches are dug. People defecate into the trenches. There needs to be a manager of the field that can provide safety and decommissions the trench when it's full by covering it with dark soil. After the use of this technology, the soil needs to be secured from the community and finally treated. This method can be a suitable option in the immediate aftermath of a crisis due to the low complexity and low capital costs involved. It can be constructed with very simple tools and materials in a short period of time in less than a day. However, this solution should be quit after a couple of days, as it is not considered an improved and safe sanitation technology and does not provide the security and accessibility of an improved toilet as required by sphere standard number two on excreta management. The risk of cross contamination still exists, as flies and other vectors cannot be kept out. The land used needs to be rehabilitated afterwards, which can be very costly. About 0.25 square meters of land is needed per user per day. This is about half a football field for 10,000 inhabitants per day. And this will add up very quickly over the course of time, is therefore not a long term solution. Slightly improved solutions are deep trench latrines. For this technology, a deep trench of approximately 1.53 meters is stuck and several dry toilet user interfaces consisting of a simple slab are built upon. The pit needs lining in order to prevent it from collapsing. This image shows how a deep trench latrine can be lined with corrugated plastic sheets and wood pillars. This can also be done with local materials such as corrugated sheet iron. This technology has the advantage of quick implementation time with local materials and low skills and capacity requirements. However, like all pit technologies, it is not suited for areas with a high groundwater table or rocky, unstable or clay soils. There is no ventilation possible and therefore flies and odors remain in use. Sludge in a public deep trench latrine will accumulate very fast and feasible emptying and transport solutions are therefore needed. Bear in mind that a deep trench latrine is not considered an improved toilet facility and should only be implemented in the acute phase of a humanitarian response when no other solutions are possible. A new service option that is being tested by different organizations is container-based toilets. Users defecate and urinate into buckets with a lid and are then emptied on a regular basis. Container-based toilets can be prefabricated with plastic molding or constructed out of readily available materials such as buckets with a simple user interface. The user interface can be the right toilet or a urine diverging by toilet that separates feeds the urine and collects them in two different containers. The main implication of this technology is that a reliable emptying service needs to be in place provided by private companies and can provide job opportunities for the affected community. A big advantage is that the toilets are mobile and can be used in existing superstructures with no need for substructures. They can also be used within the household. The mobile toilet can then be accessed day and night. This is a major plus to reduce the risk of gender-based violence by providing the safety of the private space. Furthermore, it can be used to manage child feces, an issue that is often overlooked. They are also appropriate for flooded areas or where the groundwater table is very high. The major implication is that the system depends on a high quality and regular collection service and further treatment is needed. Users need to be well trained and have to buy into this technology. This might require sustainable awareness raising and there is a risk that users could reject to use this technology.
Chemical toilets are another example of prefabricated, ready to deploy toilet facilities that can be delivered as a complete unit without need for further construction on site. This image shows the deployment of a chemical toilet on an escape route in the Ukraine. In this technology, the excreta is hygienized and stabilized in the toilet with the help of liquid chemicals such as formaldehyde and culturaldehyde. There are also biological degradable solutions that don't have disinfecting properties but can help reduce odors and unpleasant smells. These type of toilets are usually public and not suitable for a private household. We are installing uh, mobile, mobile mattress where we are trying to uh, uh, avoid people going into the grass, going into, into the forest, and, uh, and I think, I guess, that we will save lives. In a short video from Ukraine you just saw, the toilets were installed because the forest along the road was a minefield and therefore people couldn't go there for defecation. The big advantage of chemical toilets is that they can be mobilized rapidly if there is a service provider in the region. So far this is rather uncommon outside of Europe, North America and parts of Latin America. But mobile toilet businesses of different kinds are emerging. The toilets are usually very well accepted and they are very appropriate where digging a pit is not possible. However, chemical toilets are not a long-term solution and need to be replaced with a complete sanitation system. They need daily servicing and therefore a service provider. This can become very costly or very impossible if such a provider does not exist. Furthermore, a waste or treatment plant is needed to treat the sludge and laws and regulations need to be in favor of dumping the human waste from such toilets into waste or treatment plants. A borehole latrine is a technology that is used mainly in the acute response phase, where a large number of latrines need to be constructed rapidly and the site conditions do not allow for excavation of bigger pits. With a borehole driller available, this can be a quick way of digging a great number of latrines within a very short period of time. A dry toilet can be used as a user face on top. The borehole is then used like any other pit. A lining of the pit in the top section is also required, especially when there is an unstable soil. For obvious reasons, this technology can only be implemented with a borehole driller available on site. If so, it is a very inexpensive and quick way to construct, easily understood and only requires a small workforce. The requirements for the superstructure remain the same as with any other pit-based technology. As there is no ventilation possible, odors and flies are often a problem. The toilets are not suited for unstable soils and high ground. Also, the lifespan of a borehole of treatment can be quite short, and therefore a new system is needed soon after they are constructed. Lime treatments can be used for fecal sludge treatment. Lime is a fine white powder of which a sufficient amount is added to sludge and then mixed in a container. This increases the pH to 12. A high pH over enough time disinfects the sludge and slows down or stops biological processes responsible for odors. As mixing is crucial to the process, the technology usually consists of tank and a mixing device. On this image, an open tank is used and lime is added and mixed manually. Workers are wearing protective gear as there is a potential health risk if not handled properly. The correct combination of dosage and retention time of lime is crucial for this treatment and depends on the total solids of the sludge and other chemical characteristics. Therefore, the local fecal sludge has to be tested in order to determine the correct dosage. Typically, it is around 20 to 35 percent of lime per dry mass of sludge. Lime costs around 100 to 800 US dollars per ton in different countries. Lime treatment is very useful due to the short treatment time of the sludge. The process is simple and uses materials that are usually locally available. But it has to be noted that pathogen regrowth will occur again once the pH drops below 11 and therefore lime treatment is rather a temporary stabilization than a long-term treatment solution. So, in this video we learned about different feasible technologies that can be used during an acute humanitarian crisis. 
technologies that can be implemented quickly that mostly use locally available materials that can be replicated and upgraded and that serve a large number of people are preferred. So thank you very much for your attention and hope to exchange with you on the forum about different technologies. So what you, you have seen now is basically uh, user interface, collection, storage, and treatment systems for on-site for acute emergency context. So I think you might be aware of using part of those technologies. So there were some examples of a typical kind of response and some of the examples with this uh, uh, mobile toilets and so which appears in some countries and there are some examples on that. So which are not really very common yet and might not be also useful for as a context. So, um, but this has been all acute context and every time you have seen Samuel mentioning that uh, for the long term solutions, we need kind of other type of systems. So, and generally also transition from acute phase uh, into the stabilization recovery phase also implies there is transition from this communal community type of systems more as in household based solutions. So in, in many situations. So what I'm going to do also is to just very shortly go over the typical kind of technologies which are used more on household level or can be also used on community scale, which are more uh, meant to be used on a longer scale. So on the, also during the recovery phase, for example, it can be built. So some of the examples, and of course you can find much more information that in the compendium of different technologies. I just show you some of the examples. And one of the very typical one, which we know from the dry systems, for example, is a single feed latrine you can see here on my screen, which is basically, uh, like a latrine being dig into the ground where the feces can go. If you would like to improve that uh, kind of technology and avoid the flies and the orders coming inside the system, something which is which we call VAP or ventilation improved pit latrine can be used. In this case, uh, the, the way it is constructed is that we have a pipe going out of the uh, of the pit under it. So and through the air circulation inside the system. So we and the fly screen on the top of it, we avoid flights and also the order inside the pit latrine. So these pit latrines can be also base, uh, built as a raised latrines, uh, especially in the conditions where the ground or the soil is not suitable. For example, when in case when we have a flood prone areas or uh, when the groundwater table is very high or we have a really rocky ground which is difficult to dig into. So these kind of systems can be built raised, but the principle behind it is very simple. So what we also know is there are these uh, so-called twin pit systems. Uh, uh, they exist in a dry or poor flush form. So one with the water being used or just dry being used. In this case, basically for each household or a small um, area. So there is basically two pits uh, of walls which have been, been dig or been made. And the toilet uh, superstructure and user interface has been shifted from one place to another, like you see here on this picture. So this is done so is that one pit is full, uh, it's been closed and during this time, usually during about one year, the, um, uh, the fecal slush in it can further uh, decompose and basically um, kind of convert itself into the pit humus, which after can be easily excavated. So and use for example, the soil condition. Right? So in this case, uh, the treatment is used to direct, like it's, it's been done on site, it's been, it's been used directly. So this system can also exist, for example, with the ventilated improved pit, also where pit humus has been uh, done, and it's kind of built in a similar way, like the ventilated improved pit latrine is, but it's just uh, using these two, two chambers. So uh, in for flushing, so in this case, there also can be two types of pits being, being built. So basically, which is a leach pit. And in the same way, first one pit is open and being used. And after a while, there's a seal which can be switched off. And then once this uh, is full, uh, then the other toilet is being taken into, um, into use or into operation. While uh, the time is given for the first pit for water to, like the wastewater basically being formed there to infiltrate so and also to be uh, easier uh, kind of to reduce the volume. Um, also what you might uh, know might heard about is so-called the urine diverting toilets. So in this system it's also double vault system like you see here on the, on the picture. But this system we talk about the raised toilet which is built above the ground and uh, 
uh, the urine has been diverted through a toilet structure. This toilet exists as a sitting or a squatting toilet for so different type of users. So and they can, can be also used with the dry and clean material, also anal clean, uh, clean water. So and in this case, the idea is also that the toilet has been used, the urine has been diverted, the urine can be used later on and transformed to fertilizer or just being, can be infiltrated. While in this case, we have a very dry feces which are in Santa um, being co converted in type of material which can be easily used directly as a soil conditioner. So systems like this exist as well. Uh, here, I think one of the bigger questions is the user acceptance and if the user are actually willing to use this kind of toilet and accept the technology as it is. So if you think about more uh, uh, like inputs of the black water, gray water, so which means that all the water in a, um, is water is flushed toilets are being used. So, and also sometimes gray water is being also flushed directly into the sanitation system. So I think the most common technology you might heard about is a septic tank, right? So in this case, we have the inputs, which is uh, black water, gray water, and then we have settling and anaerobic processes happening inside the, the septic tank, which reduces our organics and finally we have the outlet which can be um, disposed for example as a leach field or a soak, soak feed and there is a sludge which has to be once in a while pumped out or removed from the septic tank. A little bit more advanced system um, is the anaerobic buffalo tractor which you also find once in a while so in this case it looks very similar to a septic tank except that you have these buffles so basically these balls inside the system and through this uh, the wastewater has been flowing through the uh, through the tube here and kind of passes again through the sludge accumulating in each uh, bolt of this uh, anaerobic buffer tractor. So which uh, basically optimizes the treatment and produces the wastewater inside or effluent of the better quality. So now we looked more into the on-site technologies and user interface and collection and storage treatment system. So this is the two groups we discussed now, more for the acute context and more generally used uh, kind of options which are available there for rather like a long-term uh, use. So with the treatment on-site. So as a next step, maybe we should just very shortly go through the transport and uh, off-site technologies. So if you're talking about transport or conveyance, right? So this is the way where we basically convey uh, the fecal sludge or wastewater, black water generated at the household level on site, maybe treated or not directly into the, some kind of treatment, semi sterilized treatment facility. So this conveyance, it can be of different types of time. So it can be sewered systems, the ones we know basically pipe systems, where pipes transfer in the, the liquid phase. Or this can be also non sewered systems, which are more like a vacuum truck, for example, as an example of a non sewered system. So, and what needs to be transported defines basically the type of the system you use, right? So, we talk about black, black or gray water, sludge, urine, dried feces, pit homos. So, depending on what kind of inputs we have here in the system, if the different type of technology is going to be used. And I'm not going to go very much into detail of each technology now, simply because we don't have time. If there is any interest there, we can uh, you know, spend another time <laughs> going a little bit more in detail of the other system like we did the last time. Maybe just very shortly to mention that for sewer systems, there's also two categories of the sewer system. So one of it is kind of the conventional gravity sewer, which you might know from the cities, from the urban context, but there are also simplified or shallow condominal sewers, which are basically, um, systems which are just using a, a smaller pipe diameter so the pipe diameter can be about 100 millimeter so using pvc pipes or um, hdp pipes uh, for transferring of wastewater so um, the gradients are flatter it's kind of shallow you don't put it under the big streets and deep down but it can be put for example not so not so deep under some pavement um, you know, some pedestrian walks and so, which is kind of cheaper and the conventional sewer. Of course, it's not meant for large amounts of water and uh, not meant also to transport the storm water, for example, but it can be an easy sewer option in a refugee camp or also in a, in a settlement where there's no big heavy transport the techniques going over these areas, over these pipes. So this, for example, example of lanes is kind of uh, sewer in the, in, in the urban context. Uh, comparison, for example, to a st like the conventional sewer system where you have a much bigger excavation and uh, required to do this. 
So if you talk about on-site uh, sanitation technologies for uh, the transport of excreta, right, there uh, we are kind of have to think what happens usually if the peat is cool, right? So usually, very often we observe a very common situation where the peat is simply overflowing. So there's some manual emptying cases happening, people do it by hand, there's mechanical emptying possibilities. So, or construction of the new latrine, right? So to kind of to close the pit and then move to another place and the new latrine is being collected. So in this case, the question is that we don't want to leave a situation of overflowing and we don't have space to construct new latrines, then we need to use some kind of means of emptying and transport of the fecal sludge. So, um, in case of motorized emptying, it's uh, about the motorized, for example, of, uh, using vacuum tracks, uh, which are uh, in this case uh, emptying the septic tank, which is there. But of course, the limitations there is that we need to have access of the vacuum tracks to come to this area. So uh, generally not to go too much into detail into that. I mean, uh, what I can advise you is to look in the specifically fecal sludge management. So, and in case of fecal sludge management, there is also a very good uh, book. So, and this book is uh, called, I'm sorry, I'm going over. Fecal sludge management book, which uh, looks into the system approaches for implementation and operation. So, which is also available under this link, which I'm showing here, where you can look more into the details of managing the fecal sludge. So, also maybe one of the just very shortly uh, technologies uh, uh, which are used as a transport is so-called transfer stations. You might find very often is that when the vacuum trucks come uh, and somewhere they put like in a station an underground holding tank. Sometimes it can be also bladder tanks, very simple tanks which can be used overground, basically as this intermediate storage of the uh, of the fecal sludge before it has to go over to the treatment plant later on. Mm -hmm. So now we've had a very short summary of the conveyance technologies, and we do also a very short summary of the treatment technologies there. So what I would like to say here is that we, uh, generally, if you talk about treatment, we talk about pre-treatment. So basically very simple ways of removing oil, grease, sand, or trash. So from the system, because that materials can block either the sewers or can block also the treatment facilities. So we would like to have this pre-treatment happen before actually the, uh, the real treatment occurs. The generally primary treatment methods, which are usually simpler as a settler, um, which focuses on liquid solid separation. Then we are talking about secondary treatment where we would like to remove uh, organic matter, suspended solid, uh, solids, and if you have more advanced technologies also to reduce the phosphorus, nitrogen in, uh, in wastewater. So um, the example, for example, is activated sludge is kind of process. And uh, finally, there are possibilities of a post-treatment or so-called tertiary treatment where it's a final polishing of the, um, of the wastewater or sludge or um, general wastewater or effluent sorry, uh, for removal of remaining pathogens, uh, also recovery of nutrients, and like we do it in Switzerland now, focusing on removal of the micropollutants. Yes, and generally the treatment technologies can be grouped around two types of technologies, aerobic technologies, so those which use oxygen uh, for the process, biological processes happening there, or anaerobic technologies. So as I said, with and presence of oxygen without presence of oxygen, so in case of aerobic, we talk about aerobic treatment or digestion, while in anaerobic processes, there's anaerobic treatment happening. So this is two types of, or not two types of, two types of groups of different bacteria which are being used there. So basically the aerobic bacteria are not the same like anaerobic bacteria. Also there are some facultative bacteria which can survive in those uh, conditions. So, and in the end, uh, we generate large amount of sludge in aerobic processes and lower amount of sludge in anaerobic processes. Uh, while the side effect of anaerobic production is production of the methane and CO2, which is we know more or less as a biogas. Mm -hmm. So the typical examples of aerobic technologies, for example, activated sludge or maturation ponds, constructed wetlands, compost, right? While anaerobic technologies we know as a septic tanks, anaerobic buffalo tractor, biogas production digester, or anaerobic ponds. So also in the compendium, you can find descriptions of all these different types of technologies. Uh, depending on the context, you might use one or the other, or sometimes also a combination of different technologies to make the process result. And uh, just focusing shortly on the use and disposal. So basically, 
um, there are we can define between beneficial end users and end users which is rather kind of the waste right or disposal of waste products so in case of beneficial end users i would just like to strengthen like what kind of uh, possibilities are there to use basically the products of the sanitation system and this can be irrigation so the wastewater treated to a, to extend that it's safe so it can be used through a number of uh, drip, drip irrigation systems on um, also to produce um, agricultural products so the urine from urine diverting toilets can be used as a fertilizer so the compost the soil amendment and fertilizer can be used or compost sorry can be used as a soil amendment or fertilizer so um can be improving the qualities of the soil uh, there are technologies which are producing biogas as a side product of the anaerobic digestion. So in this case, biogas can be even used for cooking in household. So we even have a humidified dried sludge, which can be used for different uh, um, uses. For example, uh, some of the sludge can be convented in kind of pellets, which can be used uh, as their source of energy. So some treated wastewater can be used, for example, in fish or aquaculture ponds. Uh, to grow some plants, so or generally um, uh, as a fuel. So I'm also would like to draw your attention to the document developed by the World Health Organization on safe use of wastewater, excreta and grey water, which is a guidelines providing the information on that. So and how some of these uh, products of end use and disposal can be used health, uh, in a healthy way, following the multi barrier approach of WHO. Uh, including health protection measures and different kind of exposure mechanisms which are there. So um, I think I'm going to jump over some of those examples simply because we don't have much time. So and maybe just to um, finally uh, look with you into this uh, technology developed by the WHO. So if you still have some little time I would show you a short video from sanitation safety planning so the video doesn't have Arabic uh, subtitles, so maybe you could try to translate it if it's possible. So, and uh, this video focuses us on the different sanitation uh, system. So basically it's different aspects of sanitation system, different technology included, but focuses more on the protection and safety and from health perspective. And since we started this uh, lecture from the health aspect and basically seeing the sanitation system as well, its primary goal to protect public health, so I think it's good if you can try to uh, finalize this section also with a point of view of the protection of the public health and safety. So, and it will introduce you also the sanitation safety planning approach developed by WHO, which is a useful tool um, for planning of sanitation systems on the long term. Are we seeing the video now? Yes. I'm Katie Endicott, taking a look at the sanitation and wastewater at the World Health Organization. In this video, I will give you an overview of sanitation safety planning and we'll look at an example. Sanitation safety planning, or SSP for short, is a risk-based management tool for sanitation systems. A safely managed sanitation system prevents exposure to disease-causing excreta at all steps of the sanitation chain, from containment through emptying, transport, treatment, and to disposal or reuse. It can be used together with excreta flow diagrams, or SFDs, shown in the previous module, to make sure that excreta reaches safe rather than unsafe endpoints. SSP reduces health impacts while increasing the benefits of reuse. SSP can be used for all kinds of sanitation systems, both in formal and informal settings. The approach is best used for improving existing systems. In communities with no sanitation, demand creation should be prioritized. So how do SSPs work? First, we need to understand the system we plan to manage. This is referred to as a system assessment phase where the sanitation chain and exposure groups and pathways are identified and expressed as hazards. Risks are assessed and when they're unacceptable, improvements are designed to reduce them. This approach ensures action is prioritized according to risk. Monitoring and management using multiple barriers along the chain ensure that the whole system is operating as intended. SSP can be applied in many settings. 
Today I'll be illustrating the approach in an informal urban setting typical of growing cities in many countries. We'll follow the chain showing examples of exposure groups, hazards, controls and monitoring at each step to build up a safely managed sanitation system that protects public health. Notice as we go that not all improvements involve extensive capital investment. Changes in management and behaviour can also significantly reduce risks. Also notice that different stakeholders bear responsibility for controls and monitoring at each step. Here is a simple pit latrine with manual emptying. Although excreta are contained in the latrine, this unimproved system poses a number of health risks. Exposure groups include the users, the workers who empty the containers and the surrounding community. Children and the elderly are especially vulnerable from contact with soiled surfaces in an unhygienic latrine. These groups may be exposed via direct excreta contact through the feet and hands, and when excreta is inadvertently transferred to the mouth via dirty hands or flies. The risks here are medium to high, depending on the exposure group. While the goal is a more hygienic, improved sanitation technology, we can still reduce risks. For example, controls such as wearing shoes, better cleaning of the latrine, personal protective equipment for workers, and using an emptying system that reduces direct contact will all incrementally improve the system. Visual monitoring of these measures by a community health worker is a simple way to check and respond if these controls are not in place. This latrine with septic tank is an improved technology that poses less risk to users than the previous situation. Let's look at the emptying process. Motorised emptying and transport is much safer than manual emptying, but there are still risks that need to be managed. A key exposure group is the workers. Hazardous vents are mostly related to blockages and malfunction of the equipment. For example, the operators may be sprayed with sludge and also contaminate the surrounding area. These risks are typically high. Here are some controls to protect workers. Providing appropriate equipment, working according to standard operating procedures, and ensuring workers wear personal protective equipment. The organisation responsible for overseeing collection and transport can set minimum standards like these and make spot checks to monitor if they are followed. In this example, all of the faecal sludge is delivered to the treatment plant, but in poorly managed systems, some may be diverted to dumping sites. This can have serious health and environmental impacts. SSB should also identify dumping as a hazardous event and include controls and monitoring to manage these risks posed to the wider community. At the treatment step, it is vital that the treatment process operates well so that effluent and biosolids meet agreed standards. If not, users of farms and consumers of the farm produce will be exposed to an unacceptable risk. The hazardous events may include overloading of the plant, breakdowns, the processing temperature and time, and the presence of flies or mosquitoes, or seasonal factors such as high rainfall that may affect performance. The risks and consequences of these are high. Example controls include proper design and construction, trained operators, and a preventive maintenance program. Monitoring may include periodic testing of effluent and checks on delivery volumes. But even the best treatment processes will occasionally not meet standards. In some cases, lower levels of treatment may be unavoidable with the existing technology or desired by farmers who wish to access nutrients for reuse. That's why barriers at the next reuse step are particularly important. During reuse, there are risks to farmers using the biosolids, especially where intestinal worm infections are prevalent. Risks will depend on the performance of the treatment plant in the previous step and the way the biosolids are applied on the farm, for example, manual or mechanical application. When produce is sold to the general population for consumption, many people are potentially at risk. Pathogens can be recycled back to the community at large and lead to a disease outbreak. This is costly in terms of public health, but can, it can also ruin the reputation and operation of businesses that reuse wastewater and sludge. The type of crop grown and the application method 
affects the risk of consumers. For example, crops eaten raw have a much higher risk compared with crops which are cooked or processed before eating. These risks are potentially high. Controls that can be used include selection of crops not eaten raw, setting a time between the last application and harvesting to allow pathogens to die off naturally, and washing of produce and clean water before sale. Monitoring may include checking crop types, application and harvesting practice, as well as hygiene during the packing and sale. We have just followed the modules in the SSP manual. First, describing the sanitation system, identifying hazardous events and exposure risks, developing and implementing improvement plans, monitoring controls and verifying performance. Coordination among stakeholders is needed to implement all controls and monitoring in a safely managed system. That's why establishing a team at the outset with members representing each step of the chain is vital to prepare for SSP. Coordination can be challenging, but evidence shows that safely managed systems lead to far higher health gains than improved sanitation alone. Further, using the multiple barrier approach reduces dependence on capital and intensive treatment technologies as the main barrier. Controls can be included at any step and incrementally improved over time as resources permit. In summary, SSP is a risk-based tool for safely managing existing sanitation systems. SSP coordinates improvements and monitoring by actors along the sanitation chain. SSP does not rely on treatment only. It uses multiple barriers including behaviours, management and technology to prevent exposure. The SSP manual that includes more guidance and tips is available in several languages on the WHO website, along with other resources to help users get started and implement SSP. Yes. So what you see, have seen now is uh, a video from WHO showing really on the whole sanitation safety um, aspect uh, and how basically to have the sanitation system finally reaching what its main goal is to protect the public health. So uh, at this point, I would like just to summarize what uh, this uh, little bit more than one hour lecture has been about. So basically we looked at different criteria influences sanitation technology selection. So different sanitation technologies incurred in acute phase of emergency and during stabilization recovery phases. So not going much into details, unfortunately, but if there is any wish there to go into detail of specific technologies, we can do that another time. So I presented you the emergency sanitation compendium. So, and um, I've tried to show you some other documents which you can find more information. So, and links on that. I think the last uh, point I would like to pay attention is this, uh, is the Octopus. So the Octopus is a collaborative platform for um, emergency fecal sludge treatment. Um, basically it has been developed with the support of Monetary Innovation Fund and it's a platform kind of based on exchange of currently ongoing activities and different uh, humanitarian organizations uh, and their experiences with the fecal sludge treatment. So if you like, you can visit the homepage and also learn more about this platform. So I hope that uh, all this information has been useful. It has been very theoretical. We didn't go much into the details of specific technologies which might be interesting for you. Therefore, I will be happy to take questions or now or later on for email or also have another section or discussion uh, on specific context which uh, specific questions you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much Marina. I think it was very, very informative and very useful and very interesting. It is very important that our uh, site planner, our engineer in Syria, they are not just putting latrines on a site and believing that it's, that it's over. All this step has to be considered and uh, have you have shown properly, it's a very complex situation starting from the user interface to the, uh, to the convenience, to the final use and disposal. So it's very important that uh, we keep in mind that it is a whole project when you do a wash and not just the construction of the sanitation. Through your um, presentation, we got a lot of readings, a lot of inputs, inputs. And I think those who are interested, they have enough to learn. This online training that you have mentioned, I think they are very useful as well. And uh, for that, I thank you very much. 
uh, and thank you for your time. Uh, we appreciate it a lot. And maybe to my colleague, David, I would like to give uh, over the word if you have some comments. Uh, not, not a lot of comments really, but just to say, um, uh, in, incredibly informative. Um, yeah, as, as Andre mentioned just before, um, uh, as site planners, you know, we don't just, or we, we, we shouldn't just think about just um, placing the toilets on the, on, on the site. There's so much to think about as, as um, you, you rightly demonstrated. So um, while in, incredibly informative, rich presentation and um, I look forward to um, going back and having a look at the video again because <laughs> I mean, it's just, there was so much in that. And um, again, thank, thank you very much for your time. It was um, very much appreciated. I, I assume uh, there are no questions. Um, it would be nice, uh, Rebecca, uh, sorry, uh, Maria, uh, Marina, if you could give me the links of those books that you have mentioned during this presentation, and this will be added on my on the YouTube uh, recordings as well. And uh, I'm looking forward to see you again in a few weeks for the second part of your presentation related to water supply. And Marina, back to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, it was also a pleasure for me. And um, as I say, I mean, happy to uh, further on uh, be there as an input person for all the questions. Yes, hopefully some questions are coming later. Thank you very much. So I think we can close the session. If everything is fine. Thank you very much for that. Thanks, guys. Thanks very much.